128 of the Cheese Stakes and Controllers podcast presented by Fox PHL The Gambler 102.5 FM 1480 AM iHeartRadio and wherever you get your podcasts is where you're listening to this right now and I appreciate you uh, this is the big PAX East preview show but I think we're going to be talking about other things just in this first segment because this is a monumental episode in cheese steaks and controller history. It will be the first ever episode where I have one guest for the entire hour. So it won't just be me badgering on about video games this week. I have somebody with me. And it's somebody who some people would say is long overdue for this show himself included in fact he'd probably be the first person to say he's long overdue for this show i'm sorry it took so long john jansen from fox phl the gambler is here and we're going to talk about pax east because we're going up there together and having some fun in boston this weekend john how the hell are you I'm doing good. I'm making my debut, and I got to make, see, you. I don't even know if you wanted me for the full hour, but I'm staying here for the full hour anyway because once I'm on here, I got to make sure I take advantage of my time. But, no, I'm <laughs> I'm so excited. And, yeah, I wanted to get on cheesesteaks and controllers for the longest time, but the thing is all the guests that you have, they're all excellent. They're all better than me. Big names, plenty of followers. Uh, it's it's amazing uh, what you've done because obviously I work at the Gambler and do all this stuff there and the Cheesesteak Controllers podcast is part of that network and um, man all the stuff you have done with Cheesesteaks and Controllers and for the station. Uh, dude you have done awesome and so I'm just glad I could be a part of this just for a little bit to talk video games. What are my other millions of passions that I have apparently? Yeah, you have, to, you have to have things that you like, and I, I appreciate those kind words. Um, so let's get right into it here. First and foremost, John, easy question, um, what you're allowed to talk about. I know we talked about things that you have, you're have you reviewing that you might not be able to talk about at the moment, but what are you playing right now? So actually that one, the embargo's been gone for a while now, but uh, oh, okay. Neptunia Sister vs. Sisters, uh, yeah, it's taken me a while to review that one because the game was a lot longer than I thought, and uh, definitely that's going to be part of the review. So I'm uh, going to start writing that one up. I just got done that game a few days ago, so I'm going to be writing that one up, uh, and I have some thoughts about that one, but also I'm an RPG guy, and I, I work for RPGamer.com, and I haven't played the Trail series, any of them. So I thought that would maybe be a good time to try it, and I feel like... Like I've started to see, you know, more of those games come out, and I just feel like it's a really good time to get into it because it was also on sale on Steam. So I wanted to play something cool on my new PC that I got, new gaming PC. So I started the tra I started Trails in the Sky first chapter. I'm starting from the beginning, and I'm glad I did. It is hitting a certain aesthetic, a type of game uh, that I I really was craving. Like I was really craving a very hardcore turn-based RPG, and Trails in the Sky fits that so well. There's so many ways to interact with the world. World, you know, newspapers that you can get to figure out what's going on in the world. Every character NPC interaction is meaningful. Uh, and I'm only in the first town so far still. Like, I'm only a few hours into this game, and I feel like I've gotten already this incredible world building and great characters and great writing uh, so far. And everybody says it's a slow burn, and to me, it doesn't even feel like a slow burn. I'm enjoying it. It's it's really hitting that itch that I kind of had. I was really looking for something classic, uh, looking for something that was really a, a very immersive kind of RPG, and it's certainly one of them. It's really so when, good so far. So when you say you're an RPG guy, is there a particular type of RPG? that you flock to Japanese RPG like Western action RPG are you uh, like a like a Skyrim Fallout sort obviously Trails means you got some you like some JRPGs but if you had to yeah. pick one or if there's one in particular that you really like like give me some of your favorite RPGs just give me an idea of what kind of uh, what kind of games you're talking about here so I am a huge, and there was um, obviously the which Yoshi Peak's comments uh, of Square Enix that this term 
Uh, maybe our definition of it should change, but under what now, what we call these games, I'm a JRPG fan. Right. Um, I, I started off with the Tales series. So Tales of is that one. And I know that's not your traditional like turn-based. I have gone back. Look, I've, I've played a bunch of Final Fantasies, you know, back in Final Fantasy VII and eight, nine. I pretty much played them all through. So I have all you of that down. But I earned Right. <laughs> I earned my stripes. I went back, played classics, but I still even... It's hard sometimes to go back to the classics because I like being in the moment. That's the way I watch movies. Like everybody yep. asks me about movies, uh, classic ones. I'm like, I appreciate those, but I like being in the moment, like seeing what movies are saying and video games are saying about things now or what the genre is now. And Chained Echoes was one I just played. You know, it was kind of oh, under yeah. that. It was a JRPG, but it's not by a Japanese developer. And it was like this old school, but really modern sensibilities and a quality of life things that I just, I, I was absolutely enamored by and it was a great it was a great rpg uh that really i think took the turn-based genre and i think actually moved it forward a lot and i think mm -hmm. it's actually going to hurt a game like sea of stars that is going to feel maybe too old school and it's going to be really hard to go back to so quick that's my quick thoughts on chains of uh chains of echoes but no really uh, the series that got me started was tales of so okay. i i love jrpgs i love you know over the top stories but what i really like are stories that are very theme focused and character focused and JRPGs, I think, do the best of that. And the Tales series, it's not, look, they're not the best stories. Like, I don't think JRPGs, uh, or especially the Tales of series, like, is doing like any some Martin Scorsese type score storytelling here. Uh, but it is still, it's fascinating storytelling with great characters uh, and really fun to play and vibrant colors, great worlds that are built. And I think that's the one thing I like too is just uh, entering all these new worlds. Um, so I, I like JRPGs and things like Xenoblade Chronicles. I played the second one and I enjoyed that, even though the end of it killed me. And then uh, Tales of as well, I'm a big fan of. There you go. So. You mentioned the uh, derogatory term, or, or the uh, what's the term? I get lessening term that JRPG was back then. I don't remember that. Um, I I just always used it as the category between, you know, like a Final Fantasy or something that was made elsewhere in the West. I never even like I thought of it as a as a derogatory term. So to hear that report what was like a month ago was like heartbreaking. Right, like I, I, it was, I always, yeah. I always thought that term was vaunted. I always put that because back in the day, like Final Fantasy seven, eight, nine, uh, Suikoden uh, by Konami, those games were some yeah. of my favorite yeah. games. So to hear that this term that my friends and I tossed around just to describe those games was actually a bit of a negative one, um, that kind of threw me through a loop for a little bit. So I'm trying not to use it as much anymore i've already failed in this episode obviously yeah i, I think um, what's going to be tough is I, I think it's it's good that we have acknowledged and yoshi p was able to bring to light like hey this term we do not like um and and there were a lot of great writers that i think went over the history of why that term turned into a derogatory term yep. or how it could have gotten that way uh, alex donaldson who uh, rpg site vg i think 24 7 uh he posted an article about it and really explained in detail kind of the history of that term and how that term has been used in a derogatory way so that is definitely a thing uh, i think for now you know it's okay to use it as long as we acknowledge and got to figure out a different term and maybe it's just all rpg you know i think i'm a metal fan as well and i think even i do a, a poor job of like this is metalcore this is what heavy metal sounds like this is sure. what alternative metal like there's so many different subgenres that maybe we don't even need to categorize them at maybe Bethesda games. I know a, a Bethesda game is different than, let's just say, a Square Enix game, but it's all still an RPG. Sure. But sure. yeah, I, I look, there are certain. And when I when I think of JRPGs, you know, I don't even think Japanese RPG anymore. There's a certain type of storytelling to me, um, and certain t a kind of narrative style, and obviously gameplay as well. That's different, but even that's kind of molding too much into one. But there is certainly, to me, uh, different philosophies that you're going to get Eastern Western philosophies. Now, again, those have all kind of clashed together because everybody's influenced by everything now. Uh, but there's a certain kind of like narrative storytelling and and sort of. Um, these hallmarks that I get out of that genre that I want to acknowledge because that's what I like the most. And that's that's what I am appealed to the most. I just wish, yeah, we, we had a better term to use for it because obviously that's been used in a very negative way. And I, I don't think that's fair to these developers that do feel like they're getting pigeonholed just yeah. by uh, uh, the way we categorize them. I wonder if we don't just call them what they are, whether they're 
action, whether they're turn based, whether they're right. I, I think that's I think that's the online. best way to describe them. I, I think you're right. Yeah, just take out where they were developed and make it what they are. I think that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, try and be a little more cognizant of in the future, um, because as you said, RPG is a massive like genre of video games, and there are so many different subgenres. There probably are ways to even better describe them than what I just said, but for now, I'm cool with like action RPG, Souls like even because that's becoming its yeah. own thing. Um, but so we talked about RPGs that you've played before. Are there any in particular that you are very excited about? I imagine Final Fantasy 16 is on your radar. Um, I don't know if Diablo 4 is the type of RPG that you like, but that's also on its way as well. So what are you looking forward to as far as RPGs are concerned? So I know I'm looking forward to Final Fantasy 16, although I will admit I'm very hesitant about it Uh-oh. Um, because I, I have a feeling it's getting too much like God of War Ragnarok and like a Devil May Cry thing. I like even Final Fantasy Remake. There were some things I didn't like about it, but overall it still had its own hallmarks. And that battle sure. system was something completely different than I remember anything else having. So uh, I just... I'm I'm kind of concerned about that, uh, but Final Fantasy 16, I'm still gonna play it, and I'm still gonna absolutely love it. Sea of Stars, I mentioned uh, again, it's this turn-based kind of classic RPG, and they're even bringing back um, for a special guest composer, uh, the composer I'm forgetting his name now, but for like Chrono Trigger and some of these big games. Uh, so I'm really Suda. excited about that one. Again, I'm I'm very timid about it because I think I think Chain Echoes ruined. Maybe what classic <laughs> JRPGs or RPGs now should be. And so Sea of Stars may be like, oh, we're going way back here. Uh, so I'm kind of concerned about that. Also, Starfield. Uh, oh, Starfield yeah. looks to be absolutely massive. I love the kind of, it's not a Star Wars game, but this kind of universe expanding element. It just, I, and also, it's part of me that's like, this thing sounds so much bigger than anything else I've ever heard before. So, I'm really interested to see, can they pull any of that off? Right. Are they actually able to pull off you know, this huge, large universe-to-universe-to-universe type game, and can they make it feel like traveling space is this big, fun exploration without making it feel really mundane? Because I bet it can feel mundane at times, traveling a big, expansive universe. So, I would agree. Uh, Starfield, I'm, I'm very excited just because of I'm, I just don't know how that one's going to go, but I want to see it. And same thing, that, that's what happened with me with Cyberpunk. Even when I knew it was bad, it didn't matter because, oh, there's this really interesting world and, and different kind of looking game that I just want to check out and I want to be a part of. Well, the problem with Starfield, I think, is it a lot of people are hesitant to go full throttle unless they're a huge because. Bethesda fan mm-hmm. because of No Man's Sky. If you yeah. recall, that was 20 what 14 I think that game came out, maybe 2015 where they promised you could go from planet to pl- or universe to universe, planet to planet, you could fly out in space and land and and every planet would be different, procedural generation, all that crazy stuff and then it came out and it was like what is this where is the content <laughs> i will say that is that no man's sky is also one of the biggest turnaround games or um, yeah or rags to riches success stories for lack of a better term where they were able to go in and fix it and add stuff and now people like millions of people still play it ironically final fantasy 14 uh which the final fantasy 16 team made before uh, the new game was also a major turnaround. They, that, people forget that when that game originally launched, it was dump. Act- absolutely terrible, <laughs> terrible stuff. And they turned that around with Realm Reborn, and now it's one of the most popular MMOs out there with one of the largest, most fervent fan bases that there is. It's, it's amazing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, that they were able to do that. And now there's a big old panel happening at PAX East, actually, on Final Fantasy XIV. Not my game, or else I would attend it, uh, but I understand it's going to be a pretty cool one uh, for those that are going up there. Uh, We will get into PAX East later on, um, but I did want to ask you also, uh, this is your first convention of this 
ilk, right? This is the first time outside of like when I say first one, it's first one you're ever covering for right with yeah. a media yeah. badge. RP RP Gamer is that what they call themselves? Yep. Right? Yeah, yeah, RP Gamer. Yep, RP Gamer uh, is who you're covering it for. You have a couple appointments. We talked about those uh, before we got started talking here. So, what are you uh, what are you looking forward to as far as attending a con as a part of the media uh, instead of being just one of the normal attendees? What do you uh, what, what what did what is your main goal other than write articles about what you're seeing uh, at this convention? Yeah, so I, I think for me, one thing I'm, I'm getting into a lot is hardware. And I just got a gaming PC, so yeah. I'm, I entered the gaming PC world. I have something called an Odin Light. Have you got into the retro uh, emulator handheld type scene? Um, I have gotten into that, and I got one of those devices that I'm actually going to bring to Boston with us to PAX East. Uh -oh. So, like, it, g gaming hard, I just, I, I can't wait to, to kind of see everything. Like, this feels like we get to see what gaming has to offer in the future and what, you know, moving forward, like what things we can expect to see. Uh, so I see Logitech there. They just you know, came out with a cloud gaming device. Uh, so I, I can even just take a look at that, see what it looks like, the form factor of it. You know, I would love to do that, but also just to, to talk games with people. Like I don't, I, I think that was missing a lot when COVID happened, the pandemic. And uh, I, I think we kind of lost the void or, or, at least understood what we lost in. We just like talking video games with people. And sometimes right. it's really hard to do. And sometimes it's really online. And so when I get to go somewhere and I get to talk to developers about games and interview them, and then I get to go, you know, media members and talk with them about games and their experiences with games and all that. I, that's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that in-person aspect. Look, I do it. I'm in discords. I, I follow podcasts and, you know, I, I, I Twitter people, so I get to talk games through that, but not in person do I get That's to right. do that a lot. Uh, so I'm really excited for that. No, I agree 100%. This is my first convention out of the city of Philadelphia pre since pre-COVID. My last one wow. was E3 2019. I did MagicCon here I in do Philly. wish I could have experienced like a good, like peak E3. Peak I, I E3. wish I could have experienced that. That would have been, if we're being honest, that would have been somewhere in the probably 2010 to 2016 range is where I would put that, at least from my own experience. Obviously, older E3s, there, there are some stories floating around about those. Uh, but if we're talking, like my first ever convention was PAX East 2010 and then E3 2010 right after that and then I went to every E3 from 10 to 19 with the exception of 13 um my sister graduated high school the day the show floor opened so I couldn't miss that so I stayed home um <laughs> but yes 2010 to 2016 peak E3 was absolutely nuts it was what you're going to have on thursday but two halls of it and both of those halls are bigger than the boston one <laughs> it was just mayhem and my dumb ass would book <laughs> <laughs> would book appointments in one hall and that for an hour and then the next hour book book one in the other hall so i'd have to run from one hall to the other and that's far man it's like it's like half a mile it's not a half a mile like quarter oh mile. whoa like a quarter mile but it's it's a long Still. <laughs> walk from one side to the other and then there's meetings meeting rooms in between meeting rooms upstairs lacc is massive if you can try and get out to e3 this year you should uh just as just to ex say you experienced e3 even though maybe there'll be an ast asterisk next to it we don't know but uh <laughs> we, don't, we honestly don't know what's going on with e3 2023 i just know that i have a media badge i was apparently the first one to apply for it of course uh, which that I don't, sounds like jason finale does not sound like i don't know how i did that <laughs> but uh, um but to, yeah, so peak E3s were just a cacophony. You would walk into this uh, expo hall, whether it was South Hall or West Hall, and you would just get hit with noise and lights and people and just absolute mayhem. But I loved every second of it. I, I treasure those memories, and I wish, I wish E3 would go back to those days, but I just don't think it's ever going to happen um so pax is going to have to be 
my substitute for now. Uh, and it will do it, and PAX is great. Don't get me wrong. I will love this. I'm very excited to go. Yeah, just I, I think what out. you it doesn't have the hype. Like there's not like, oh my gosh, Xbox just announced this huge thing. Like I don't that's what E3 E three was so mainstream, but every announcement was huge and it was industry shifting. Like I don't think I'm gonna get that out of PAX East, but I'm checking out a game called Demon School. That's like this yeah. really like Shimigami Tensei type thing uh, with like a Italian horror. Like I'm, I'm so excited to get my hands on games that I think are really hard when you're in this industry uh, that I'm sort of in now. Like I'm dipping my toe into, and I find it hard. Like okay, I have to prioritize my time to play certain games because I have to review games, um, and then you know I have to find time to play other games that I want to. So it's really hard sometimes to get your hands on everything, but just to be able to check for you know uh, just a few minutes of what that game's going to be like, and just to see it and have it in my hands, and to test out all these different games and all these ideas that developers have. You know, I think that's what PAX East is going to be good for. Uh, it's not like the, the, you know, this big E3 thing that I, I know you're um, you're talking about here, but at least it is. To a smaller extent, I get to check out what's new, even if it's something just like an indie game uh, or something that's coming out, you know, soon. You know, uh, a good way to like, like a good way to describe the difference, um, if I could, and it's timely considering uh, what's going on in the sports world right now. <laughs> PAX East is March Madness. It's a lot of smaller institutions. There are some big ones. There are some heavy hitters, but they're all there. They're all represented, um, and they all have something to show. E3, peak E3, was the NBA Finals. It was oh, okay. the nice. big, big <laughs> companies. And there were small like ones, Like Warriors, too, Cavs well. type NBA Finals, right, too. Like right. we're talking. This, <laughs> yeah. th that was our Super Bowl. The eyes of the world were on the gaming yeah. industry for a solid week every single year. And that is why I think E3, I, if I could, I would save it. I don't know that that's going to happen, obviously. We'll see what happens in 23. But they've, al they've already made some changes that I think work. Making one hall industry only. And having that open two days before the public hall is even open. And then the public hall is accessible by industry, too. So for two days, the uh, industry media has access to everything. And then the third day, the public's there. And then they get their own day on Friday. So it's two for just industry, one for mixing, and I believe actually Friday and Saturday. So two for the public. That's awesome. So I can get in get my stuff done and get out so i before the public not that not that the public should be there gamers are gamers but it's a lot harder to maneuver those halls when they have the public in there as well that was a big complaint um in those later years of e3 for me was just it was just too many people right they were they were boasting some of the biggest con numbers they'd ever had, but the uh, the majority not the majority of those, but a good a decent amount of those were public, were people who weren't media, they weren't industry, they were just there to stand in line and take up space and make it harder for me to get from one booth to another because they really <laughs> want to play Kingdom Hearts, but I have to go over there to the booth next to Square Enix, and it's it just makes it more difficult. Um, but that's more of a personal gripe, I guess. Um, maybe that's why the glory days of E3 were when the public weren't invited, but I digress. It doesn't matter. New E3 is making good changes there, accommodating the industry. The, the, there was a nice thread a couple weeks ago by someone who's like on the forefront of this new E3 talking about how booth prices were similar to PAX and, and other changes that they're making. The, some people might see it as too little too late because Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo have already said they're not going, but... I see a potential, and maybe I'm glass half full here like I always am, but <laughs> <laughs> I see a potential where 23 lays a groundwork that shows that whatever the new E3 is could work, could be good, and then 24 comes back, maybe you get Nintendo back or you get Xbox back. They Never Xbox. And Nintendo, I think, would be the biggest, uh, the, the, the best 
bet to get one of the big three back. Mm -hmm. They see the value in putting things in front of people as opposed to just the live streams. I love the live streams. Don't get me wrong. I watch every single one of them. Nintendo Directs, PlayStation um, State of Plays. or the State of Play, yeah. I love them. But there is something about the -the on-the-ground feedback from a player who has the controller in their hand checking this game out. And the only time that happens is at cons like this. That is something you cannot replace. And if you think you can, there may be some hubris involved, and that's a problem. So I am hopeful for E3. I've talked about it many times on the show. Uh, But we have PAX first. And after the break... John and I, who is still here, by the way, I kind of went huff on a rant there. John is still <laughs> no, here. No, it's a good one, too, because I think E3 was, it's a, it's a it was a big part of gaming and learning about games, and, and it was, you know, to create buzz. But maybe it just, maybe it serves a different purpose down the yeah. road, you know? But I think you're right in that this is a big year to find out what, what E3 really is now. What it is, yeah, and that's the truth. But coming up after the break, we're going to go through the Expo Hall layout, look at the booths that we want to check out, the games that they have, and uh, give you some things, if you're heading up to Boston, that you should check out as well. Stick around. All right, welcome back to episode number 128 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast special episode where I am joined for the entire show by Mr. John Jansen of Fox PHL Gambler, as I will be joined by Mr. John Jansen in Boston for PAX East 2023, uh, starting for us on Friday, but the expo starts Thursday and runs until Sunday. And now, John, I'm going to ask you, uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that we know we're going to see, some of the things that are going to be on the floor, and some of the things we're looking to do while we are up or shipping up to Boston, as the Dropkick Murphys would say, and you hear every year on March 17th. John, what is one game that you are very excited for one game for sure is i cannot get my mind off of demon school uh it's got Ah. this really cool old school looking feel again the shimigami tensei uh influences but it's i'm a big movie guy uh if you didn't know that jason finelli i'm a very if you want to follow me on letterbox at jjsn34 you can do that and see all of my terrible movie reviews Uh, but (laughs) i it's influenced by like 70s Italian horror. And I can't wait to even talk with the developers about how they, um, why that genre specifically and why specifically that kind of style of horror um, they wanted to make into a game and how that was influenced by that and uh, how it maybe influenced some of the way their their story is, um, you know, where they got the idea from it. But that's one for sure that I, I just, the aesthetic, the influence, it's it's really got me intrigued in how that's all, you know, going to come together. And I think it's going to make for, I think, a really cool looking and also um, very fun game. So how many times have you seen Suspiria? Um, Suspiria, I don't, I don't think I've seen that. Oh, what's a 1977 Italian horror film? It's the only one I know about. Oh, okay. See, that's what I wanted to at least watch one. So I do see it's on a website for free uh, that I can stream it on. So I might have to check that out before I do. So I have some background. There was a remake. Uh, Oh, there was. Yeah, I'm seeing that in 2018. Ah, okay. Well, I got some things to check out then, Jason. Because yeah, it's it's just how how they can you know how they can take a a movie genre like that and make it into a video game. I, I find that really really interesting. I agree. I think that's uh, that's really really cool. Um, some genres I feel like fit into gaming better than others, and I feel like horror has this like universal appeal to it. Obviously, horror in games is huge. But the Italian style, like Suspiria and the other ones out there, that I'm right there with you. I don't know. I might leave Demon School to um, you telling me how you liked it. Because yeah. I don't know if you know oh. this about <laughs> me, John Jansen, but I'm a giant wuss when it comes to certain games. Um, you know, I have actually, I used to be a wuss about horror movies, and I've watched so many of them in the past like year and a half. Um, I even just watched Scream. So I've, I've oh, yeah. very very slowly started to appreciate more the horror genre and i think that definitely you know piques my interest even more here that i'm i'm starting to get into a lot of that stuff yeah i uh famously among my friends uh the remember fear first person shooter horror game with the the girl that looked like the ring chick um but she wasn't it was different 
Uh, <laughs> so that came out like 2006. I famously played through that game, the first one, by <laughs> watching a little bit on YouTube and then making that progress and then watching a little on YouTube <laughs> and then making that progress because the story fascinated me and it was easy achievements, if I remember correctly. But I, it, I was a wuss. I still kind yeah, of one game I actually kind of became a wuss about. I don't know why. It was, I was probably just in my head a lot. was Resident Evil 7. Um, oh, got first me because it was a first lot. Person. Yeah, first person, a lot of jump scares and stuff. I was not ready for that. And uh, I, I kind of knew that it was you know, a, a shorter game. You know, it's really you know, yeah, collecting resources and stuff and getting yourself out of this, this house and the situation that uh, the character was in. But still, I was not ready for a lot of those and like really panicky moments of, oh, my God, the guy's about to come get me. I have to open this door, find the keys that I just got and open the door and get out. And uh, yeah, it <laughs> kind of scared the crap out of me at first. I definitely yeah. got to go back to it. But yeah, games like that do. Uh, it's terrifying. And you would think that at a place like PAX, where you might be playing a horror demo and you know, you're know you in a crowded convention hall, so a lot of the scares are lost on yeah, you. Yeah, I feel a little right? safer. <laughs> well, in 2013, um, Outlast was on the PAX floor, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was some horror game where they put you in like a curtain. It was like a curtained room, like this little vestibule like a confessional almost and you went in and they put the camera uh, the camera they put the curtain around you there may have been a camera in there watching your reactions oh, it was no. pitch black in there and that's how you <laughs> played the demo and i was flat out no i'm not doing that so somebody else had to play that demo for me because i wasn't handling that i'm hoping i don't have a similar experience with two of the games that i know that i'll be seeing while i'm up there both of them remakes of classic um, scary titles from back in day. First one is System Shock Remake. That one I am very interested in. This is a, uh, a franchise that was PC um, when it first came out back in the good old days. And I did not have a game in PC. I was basically console exclusive at the time. So I am not really familiar with System Shock. I know that it's very influential. I know that Shodan, the malevolent AI, is like the bad thing, but I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm curious what I'll be able to learn from this 30-minute demo. Um, I believe it's coming out soon as well. Um, I don't know if it's coming out on everything or if it's coming out on PC first and then consoles later, but it is coming out soon. Um, so I'm curious to see how far ahead it is, it is, it is as well, and see how they've adapted it to um, the current console, the current output sort of thing. But also, too, uh, over at THQ Nordic's booth, I have um, four different things that I'm seeing, and one of them is the Alone in the Dark remake that was announced, I think, in the summertime, I think is when they first revealed that. Um, that's another one that looks like it's getting a really creepy coat of paint, just as the Resident Evil remakes did, especially the recent ones. So I'm, I'm curious what they're going to do there with that storied franchise. If you remember, there was one in like 2010 for 360 and PS3. It was called Alone in the Dark. It was supposed to be a big reboot of the franchise, and it was fine. Like, it wasn't. It wasn't breaking down the doors, but it also wasn't god awful. It was like right in the middle there, and they never—I don't think they ever followed up on it. So if they're rebooting again, I, I'm guessing inspired by Resident Evil two and three, and now four. Um, I'm curious what's going on there. Uh, so that's another one that I'm looking forward to, but not like looking forward to potentially getting scared of my wits because <laughs> I am a wuss. Um, but yeah, we're looking at this expo hall here, and there is a lot of studios here. This booth is, um, so this expo hall layout is filled with booths. Um, big names that you would expect, Pokemon, which is doing something with cards, not with games. I did get the email about that. Uh, Nintendo VS Arcade, will they be having Mario Kart and uh, Splatoon tournaments? Uh, did you forget about Smash Brothers Nintendo? What's that about? Um, THQ Nordic has a big booth. Intel has a big booth. Corsair, new PC guy. You should check out Corsair's booth. I was about to say well. Corsair, Aorus, uh, which is Gigabyte. I have a Gigabyte monitor that I absolutely love. So nice. 
uh, to check out things from there. And also, since we do radio, Audio Technica is going to be there. And guess what, Jason? The headphones I'm using now, the left headphone went out. So I am in, oh, the, market in the market for a new headphone. Yes, I'm in the market. Uh -oh. <laughs> I can't you're wait to check that reviews booth out. For RP Gamer soon. <laughs> I'll have to see if that's part of the review uh, reviews I can do. <laughs> if not, hey, you're about, no offense to RP Gamer, I'm sure they love you and you love them, but you're about to meet a bunch of editors. Yes, uh, may maybe. And, or maybe my program director here will be like, hey, you know, uh, you know iHeartRadio, be like, see, maybe I, I, I could use some good headphones and we can work a deal out. Ooh, <laughs> write it off as try a and use expense. Try and use that aspect. See, there, there you is. go. <laughs> I'm going to clip just that part of the show. There's an hour-long show that we're doing. I'm going to take that part out and put that yeah, on Yeah, blindside my program director it. with an expense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, <laughs> that'd be a great one. <laughs> You're going to go in to your next uh your next show with him uh, you do three to six right you're still doing the uh yeah i do three to six with sean uh every uh tuesday and thursday and then i do my own show um it's various times but at night and in the evening right uh, that i do uh, oh tuesday i was gonna say why aren't you doing it right now but recording on tuesday and you just said tuesday thursday you don't do it um but yeah, you'll go in for your next Tuesday and he'll be like, I am not buying you any headphones. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that is probably not gonna happen. But no, no you're you're right. All the all the the hardware, because again, Logitech's theirs too, and they came out with this cloud device uh recently. So uh, it's just all that stuff of of finding, you know, different things for a PC, you know, small little I saw there was a pillow. Jason, did you see about this? I, I got it in an email, like a gaming pillow. Like, I'm all in, I'll check that out. I did not see the gaming pillow. Did the, is it? For, will it be at PAX? Yes. Yeah, it's going to be at PAX. Um, at PAX, but I, my schedule, I didn't want to put too many things. I was like, maybe that's when I, I leave alone. But there are, there's just so many things that, you know, I now as a PC gamer too, that I am really interested, just even small, small things like, you know, keyboard pads or keyboards themselves uh, or things like a gaming pillow, gaming chairs, uh, any other, you know, hardware devices that I can look at because, again, you know, I got something, if anyone's heard of it, the AYN Odin. I think it's called Ion uh, is the company. They're coming out with new low-key hardware. Uh, I, they're not going to be there, but I'm just saying there's there's all this hardware coming out that I'm sure is going to be at PAX East, and I, I can't wait to just see what what's there because stuff like this, you know, these retro, retro handhelds, uh, PC gaming is just getting uh, crazy on absurd levels and... Uh, I'm seeing all of that there, especially like you just said, Corsair, uh, Aorus, all of that stuff. Looking forward yeah. to. PC gaming is becoming a major part of my life too. Like I built one over the uh, pandemic. I wish I would have built one. And I don't know. I, I didn't realize how effective it would be, but like, I love it. I I, I do I do love playing. Um, on PC from time to time. I yeah, don't get the, what I think, what I think I felt. Yeah, no, I'm not because I'm my specs are good enough for like really good 2K gaming. Like I can do Fortnite uh, 2K on like performance mode and get like 144 FPS out of it, which is good. Like I get really, I, I do honestly, I got a good enough rig where I get um, some really good performance. I don't think it was the performance I was looking for. So, like I, I said with this retro emulator that I have, retro handheld, uh, I. I really like messing with things, and I really like having options of how I can play games and uh, the different ways that I can play them. You know, I, I just love tinkering with with different kind of settings, uh, all of that. I, I I very much got into um, this the more you know option side of gaming because when you're on a console, you're just you're stuck with whatever software system that console has, and you do whatever that console allows you to do with a PC, it's it's yours. It's it's a wide open, and of course you're on Microsoft or whatever the operating system you have. But it's still again more options to you to figure out how you want to play games, what kind of games you want to play, how you want to play them. All sorts sorts of options, um, and of, of course the modding community is is incredible. And so things like that. I just I got really into messing with games, yeah. and uh, I love that PC gaming gives you that in, in just troves. That's true. There's a huge modding community right now in uh, Mo Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom 3, and it makes me want to play the Nice. Game. The stuff that they're doing is 
Uh, phenomenal. Um, I would love to see them on the PAX East show floor, but I kind of get why they wouldn't be there. Um, mod- the modifications are probably not something that they want to officially endorse, but I know that. Oh, yeah. Like, big fan of them. Um, I will say, too. Yeah, I love how also- I love how gaming and even cots was like, we don't want to endorse it, but it's there. Like, they'll tell you, it's sure. there. If you want it, we're just not going to really talk about because I feel like Xbox did that. I don't know if you got into the Xbox Series X and S that you can go into the developer mode and, you know, put in all these emulators like it, it was Xbox. Their way of telling you that, like, we are not going to tell you that's what you can do with your Xbox. But if you do it, we're not going to stop you. And I'm like, OK, fantastic. Like Watch a console that's kind of like, yeah, exactly. Like things like that. You know, um, it's not like hacking into your system. Like it's just giving you this way of, you know doing more things with it and so i I feel like they do a good job of like you know this is your product like this is your hardware like we want to give you at least some options to to do what you want with it and to to how you want to use it makes sense to me yep um speaking of there's one other game i want to get into before we go to break here and that is Gollum: the lord of the rings by data like this is a very fascinating game to me because it was, you know, pretty decent profile, had an April release date, I think it was. Then out of nowhere, not only did they delay it, but they delayed it with no follow-up date, which you never really see much anymore. Um, I So I'm curious to see what is happening with this game, where it is in its development, why they might have delayed it in the first place. Um, I know that the studio that made it also made a game called Styx, uh, which... A lot of people are thinking that this game is going to play a lot like. So if you've never heard, I think it's Sticks Masters of Shadows is what it's called. So if you want to check that game out, uh, it may give you an idea of what to expect here with Gollum. But uh, that is one where I'm like, I really want to know what is going on with this game and what happened to it. Because I feel like a Lord of the Rings game of this profile should have a little more um, going for it. But we'll see. Um, so that I'm definitely seeing. I'm going to head over to Yacht Club. Love Yacht Club games. Celia Schilling's been on the show multiple times. It would be nice to put a face to a name for once, shake someone's hand or high five or fist bump or whatever they want to do uh, and play some games there. Devolver Digital right next door on the show floor. I believe they're bringing something Cult of the Lamb uh, related. We'll see about that. Um, but I don't know. It's, I know all I know is it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. Is there anything that you uh, you didn't get a chance to talk about that you want to look forward to? Yeah, so I actually just got an email about this too. Um, oh. With Xseed, uh, oh, I yeah. got my confirmation of when I'm going to be there and the game's going to try. And I think the one that's getting a lot of fanfare is uh, Trinity Trigger, and we're also checking out another Trinity game. So popular Trinity games, I guess we're going to be seeing in the future. But uh, Trinity Trigger is a big one, getting a lot of attention and hype, and that one uh, I think is coming out in like April. But there's another one that caught my attention, and it's kind of – it's not like Demon School, but it's the same thing of like it's um, – school teenagers fighting demons and stuff but it's a really uh, different type of of game and storytelling narrative but it's kind of like you you kind of loop through this this i guess moment in time and your decisions really matter uh in this style of game and also it looks gorgeous it has like almost a studio i'd say studio ghibli but really nice anime looking uh, almost movie looking like style um, that you would see in like your name and you know Ghibli that it's just it's got this great gorgeous look and aesthetic and the gameplay uh, I think it's gonna end up being like a turned turn-based RPG uh, but also that mechanic the storytelling mechanic is is something that I'm really interested in so yeah loop 8 summer of gods is, is one that I'm really really excited about seeing cool uh, that's one I will keep on my radar as well. Not sure if I'm going to make it over there, but uh, there might be another one where you have to tell me uh, where what's what's good about it and why I should check it out when it actually launches. But coming up after the break, we'll touch on some panels and some other things happening at PAX East this weekend that we're excited to check out. Uh, and if you're headed up there, look for us. We'll be walking around the show floor, looking at games and saying hi to people. So uh, make sure you find us up there in the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center if you're headed to PAX East 2023. Uh, we'll be back with more about PAX after the break. Stick around. 
All right, welcome back to the final segment of Cheese Sticks and Controllers, episode numbers 128, PAX East Preview Edition. Now we're going to talk about the panels uh, that we are most excited to talk about, uh, most excited to see, excuse me. Um, I'm very excited that John, John Jansen has joined me for this entire show. Uh, I'm talking about PAX East and video games, just having a chill hour of... Uh, great talk with a great dude and honestly i have a feeling he'll be back because this was a lot of fun um depending on if he you know could could stand me at pax east <laughs> no oh my god no i feel like i feel like you're not going to be able to stand me i'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> oh, i'm gonna be one. so overwhelmed by all of this and i'm gonna ask you one too many questions about how to do things that's nah, fine <laughs> It's fine. So I'm I'm really leaning on this one here for you to be my uh my my guide. Nah, we'll we'll get it done. <laughs> but yeah, so we're uh, right now we're going to list a couple of panels that you should go check out if you're heading up there or uh, keep an eye on if you're uh, following it on Twitter or whatever. Just for maybe not for news per se. Some of them might have some gaming news, but these are ones that are going to be fun. People are people there are going to be good. Discussion's going to be good. All of it's going to be good. Uh, and you should check those out. And I will let John start. What do you got? So the first one is actually going to be a Thursday one. Uh, of course, just depends on when we get there, if we can actually go to it. But uh, it's one that I'm absolutely going to recommend. It is called Video Game Tinder Swiping on Our Favorite <laughs> Characters. Uh, it's got some some great people on that panel. I love Norma DFM and Axe of the Blood God, Eric Van Allen and Kenneth Shepard are going to be on there. Also, Jared Green. Uh, uh, Carly Veloci and Janet Garcia, uh, all really great people. And I think with the way video games are now, a lot of, I've already named a lot of like um, life simulator type stuff and school simulator type stuff. So obviously you get to date a lot of people. And so video <laughs> game tenders, I, I think absolutely perfect. So uh, that's when I, I definitely would love to check out. That is a solid idea there. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I worked with Carly Veloci at a uh, iMore uh, for a little while, a couple years ago. She's great. Um, so I'm excited to see her on that panel too. Open we can make it up there um, by 7.30 to check that out. If we can get our badges too, I think that's going to be the big... Uh, I know, it's going to be one big rush. So maybe yeah. maybe it won't happen. But we'll see I mean, we if we do. do, yeah. Video game Tinder is on my, <laughs> is on my list. <laughs> yeah, maybe we leave at 11.30. That's the earliest we can leave. I know we said noon. Maybe 11.30. Um, but... Yep, so I'm looking forward to that now, too. Uh, I missed that when I first scrolled down. I'm glad you pointed that out to me. Uh, first one I'm excited for is, um, so friend, long-time listeners of this show will know uh, well, about What's Good Games. I've talked about them before. Uh, the co-founder and the head honcho, the ringleader, as she calls herself, Andrea Renee, I've known for years, met her at the Video Game Awards 2010 um, so that's how long I've been doing this. Uh, she has What Goods Game live uh, from 8.30 to 9.30 on Friday at the Bumblebee Theater. Andrea, Brittany Brombacher, you may know as the Blonde Nerd, uh, now calls herself the Whiskey Lover. Um, Rihanna Manuel Pena, I hope I said that right, Manuel, Manuel Pena, I hope I said that right, and Doc Brooks slash The Professor will all be there uh, doing What's Good Games live. They will discuss working from home, having babies, video games, and perhaps, according to their official listing here, another Fruit by the Foot eating contest. Who can say? So that'll be a great one. If you've <laughs> ever listened to their podcast, you, uh, you know what to expect. If you have never listened to their podcast, you absolutely should they are great um they do obviously podcasts on all your streaming services but also uh every friday they put their podcast on youtube a video version that you can watch as well um great stuff they do great work there and i expect that this live one will be a lot of fun and it's one that i can actually get to so i'm hoping i can go there and support them that'll be very very cool um john what do you got yeah, I'll go with one I think I'm going to get to because I got to squeeze in between because I'm going to talk about two panels that also feature Acts of the Blood God um, hosts. But I want to do another one. I'm a big game do games done quick fan, Jace Finelli. You know, summer it's summer games done quick. This past year, I was tweeting about it. I bought a T-shirt. Absolutely love it. So they're speed running a lot of really cool games. So I'd recommend trying to check out. I think they have a speed running stage. Uh, yeah, they do because this is at the speed running stage. But Saturday six o'clock. They're doing a Games Done Quick Anyone Can Learn to Speedrun panel. I've always, Ooh. always wondered about what it would be like to take that initial step to speedrun a game. Not only just to speedrun it, but pick a game, uh, how you can do it, you know, the community and how, how you 
are able to communicate with an entire community of speedrunners to help you speedrun a game, how you learn about the, uh, you know, speedrunning and all of these little different quirks to all of these games. I'm very fascinated by that. And I just want to see if I could do it. I don't know if I'll ever be able to, Jason, but as long as I could say, hey, I can somewhat speedrun a game or know how to do some things to speedrun a game, I've always wanted to at least try that out. So I'm very interested in that one. So at 6 o'clock Saturday, anyone can learn to speedrun panel. That'll be a fun one. If I can get there, I might go with you. Um, and also, too, if you ever need a more direct uh, contact there, good friend of mine and a previous Cheese Takes and Controllers interview subject and uh, just a friend of the show and a friend in general, his name is Carl Germ. Carl Germanovich is a Dark Souls speedrunner with the Speed oh, Souls organization wow. and has been featured on a GDQ before, I want to say. AGQ. That's the one that impresses me the most because yeah. my Elden Ring... Uh, playthrough did not go well. I did beat, nope. so I did beat the Demon Souls remake. So I have beat a Souls like game, but okay. I have got my butt kicked in those games, and to see people beat them effortlessly is fascinating. To yeah, me. he crushes them. So if you follow Carl Carl Germ on Twitch, K A R L G E R M. Uh, and you could see him speed run the Souls games all the time. Now, he was featured on AGDQ, I want to say 2022, but not for a Souls game. Uh, there is a game within a game. So, Night in the Woods, indie game made by Finji. There's a game inside of that called Demon Tower. That's what he did a speed run on. Uh, a game within a game. Fascinating run. I'll link it to you when we're done so you can watch Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, and then check out his channel as well. Next one, uh, again, I keep saying friend of the show and previous interview subject. I really have done more on this show than I think I do. Imposter syndrome <laughs> is real, people. Um, Mega Cat Studios, uh, developers of the upcoming Wrestle Quest, which will also be featured at the Skybound booth, if I remember correctly. Uh, team members James Deegan and Zach Manko, the two men who were on this show as well, alongside a to-be-determined legendary wrestler. I have a, a thought, but I don't know for sure. And gaming historian Patrick Hickey as they walk through the layer-by-layer -layer breakdown of how they brought traditional Japanese RPG mechanics to the wrestling ring. Peek behind the scenes with case studies and feedback lessons learned from fans, pro wrestlers, and RPG super fans. I am all about this. This game looks awesome. Everything I've seen about it so far makes me really want to play it. And being able to hear from the team themselves on what they've been doing and whatever that to be determined legendary wrestler is um if i had to predict one based on their uh twitter activity i would say it was uh j e double f j a double r e double t <laughs> jeff jarrett but we will see we will see because he's in the game as well i believe um but that is definitely a panel that is on my schedule Perfect. I'm going to go. That's a great one, too. Obviously, I'm a big wrestling fan. I have too many hobbies, too many uh, too many things I'm passionate about. But wrestling's one of them, so that one definitely interests me. And the next one, of course, my favorite podcast, but Axel the Blood God doing a really cool drafting the ultimate RPG. So what they're going to do is draft things like party, protagonist, uh, settings, uh, score, so soundtracks as well, and just you know draft the ultimate RPG. So I am a football and sports guy, so drafting is big for me. I love fantasy football drafts. Um, I love all of that stuff. So to be able to draft the ultimate RPG sounds like a ton of fun to me. So uh, I'm I'm definitely interested in that as well. That's a great idea. Yeah, it is. I I just idea. like things like the setting and art. You know, what, what games would you consider for that that draft? So is um, that yeah? Is that how they're doing it? Like 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 the setting I pick. Yeah. So of what they have on the description. Yeah, exactly. So party Ooh. and protagonist to its score, setting, and art. Uh, so that's that's the thing about RPGs too. There are so many different elements. Like there are some games I really love just because of the soundtrack. One game that comes to mind is I Am Sasuna. Not a great game at all. It was um, really like a pretty like cheap kind of turn-based RPG, kind of like uh, Chrono Trigger copy, but it had an all piano soundtrack. Uh, and it was in this really snowy setting, but the piano soundtrack played so well with it. Uh, and it was one of my favorite gaming soundtracks. But it's not a great game. But that stands out in my mind because of that you know set different settings stand out art styles stand out uh so yeah that is that is a great idea i think of child of light as well from ubisoft nice it came out in like 2013 2014 the game was good but its soundtrack was what i remember it for 
Um, but so yeah, I'm right there with you on that. What a great idea! It just gave me an idea for a future episode. I'm gonna have to put that in the uh, in the burner because I have. A, Look ooh, at that! That's ooh, what happens when ooh. you get me on. Now you now you're trying ooh. to find out, you know, future Hope episodes. RPG- Wait, am I? I gotta be on this episode now. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. Oh, uh, no? It, well, the only reason I would say no is because I don't think it's RPG related. I have a draft idea, but. Ooh, okay. So I, I can know, just still it, be, I can be a listener. Be like I am a I key stakes and controller. Well, I, well, we'll talk about it later. I'll, I don't want to spoil it on air. I'll, talk, I'll ask you after we're done of what my idea is. So getting back to panels, I have two that are talking about. Um, full franchises, and they just happen to be two of my favorite franchises. The first one is Zelda Universe Presents Understanding the Zelda Timeline. If you've never been to ZeldaUniverse.com uh, here on the internet, they are the quintessential Zelda resource. No, unofficial, I should say. Zelda resource. They, are, they have fantastic information on every Zelda game that's ever come out, and they are going to have a panel 2.30 to 3.30 on Friday talking about the full Zelda timeline. Their description reads, when it comes to The Legend of Zelda few topics are as controversial to fans as the Zelda timeline. Why are there so many links in Zeldas? And what's up with all the timeline splits? Join the <laughs> Zelda Universe team for a lighthearted look at the timeline and learn how all the games link <laughs> together. Be sure to brush up on your Zelda knowledge as there will be trivia and prizes. And five of the Zelda Universe team will be there. And Amanda Van Heel, Andrew Fick, Elias Thompson, Peyton Garrett, and Alex Trevino. That will be awesome if you're a Zelda fan or if you have dabbled and you want to see like where the series has come from. This would be a good reference point for you. And then also, uh, later in the day on Friday, 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, in the Albatross Theater, a Mass Effect fan retrospective. So this one will be going across the entire uh, Mass Effect franchise. Uh, talk about, uh, looks like they're going to be talking about the franchise itself uh, and how it brought people together both online and off. That will be headed by Cypher of Tear, who is great. If you have never heard of Cypher of Tear, she is a fantastic uh, listen and watch. Great, great. Uh, content creator uh lady luck 34 uh, i think it's das beef das b-i-f <laughs> could be das biff um i hope it's beef shana moon dm jazzy hands and dj knight who is another great one um i haven't heard of everybody on the panel but the ones i have heard of are awesome so i expect that that panel will be awesome if you are a fan of commander shepherd like i am those games are great by the way uh, Mass Effect 3 was had a great ending, and you people didn't appreciate Now I'm not getting into that. <laughs> that is not a debate I'm getting into. Yeah, what kind of discourse are you uh, going to start on here again? <laughs> 11-year-old discourse. Yeah. Uh, people who, are, who have been waiting for someone new to jump on. Here I am, people. Mass Effect 3 was fine. Go ahead, John. Uh, so another <laughs> one, I, and this one's a tourney. Um, so it's Ooh. a tournament, and, and I... I Kind of just struck me now because, like, we get you know the usual like Mario Karts and Splatoons and stuff, but I'm sure. seeing, and it was my favorite thing to do when I was a kid. And me and my brothers and sisters and family would all do tournaments of this, but Pokemon Stadium mini games uh, for a tournament five o'clock to seven o'clock on Friday. Uh, that absolutely intrigues the hell out of me. I love Pokemon Stadium mini games, I think they were so much fun. I would probably lose in all of them. There are a few I do pretty well at. Um, Clefairy was the worst one because you had to memorize all of the moves and stuff, and I suck at memorizing things. Uh, but yeah, Pokemon Stadium mini games are so much fun, and the fact that there's a tournament of it now is spectacular. Uh, I haven't seen that before. I'm probably sure there has been some before, but I haven't seen it before, and I definitely want to check it out. That's awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that What a great idea just to feature a weird... <laughs> like, like niche sort of thing. I, I don't want to say Pokemon is niche. It's not. But Pokemon but po- Stadium mini games, <laughs> yeah, that's niche. That's where it it's gets great. Niche. That's good stuff. Oh man, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that to my attention. I may I may have to check that out too, just to see what the heck they're going to be doing. Uh, and yes, I agree with you. That Clefairy one, oh, fairy, very tough. Fairy, no, no, fairy. stop. Stop Fairy. John. Fairy. John. I, I hate that I know all of the ways that they, they do it and how that melody goes. I hate that I still know that. <laughs> it's just seared into your skull. It is really. It's lasered into <laughs> that part of my brain and never going to leave. No, no. And um, 
if you want to come back on this show, you won't say it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't get that th- veiled threat out uh, without laughing. Um, but <laughs> anyway, this this particular this next panel, um, it's, it's my second to last one here. I'm going to say something, and if you're listening, you're going to think I spoke wrong. But this is a real thing that people follow, and it has fascinated me how fervent and how crazy people get into it. But I've no, I've no idea what it is. So I may try to attend this uh, Friday from twelve to one at the Condor Theater. What the heck is Blaze Ball? So the <laughs> the 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 official description reads we are all love blaze ball is a common motto <laughs> for blaze ball fans blaze ball is the hit massively online ttrpg disguised as a baseball theme horror simulation made by the game band from blaze ball play-by-play announcers to the editor-in-chief of a blaze ball news organization <laughs> We have a panel of super fans who want to talk about how Blaze Ball is special, sp- share their favorite moments, answer your questions, and inspire you to love it too. This is a fan panel not affiliated with the game band. So the, <laughs> the four people on the panel are Joey T. Badger, the play-by-play announcer for the Splorts Hub, Keeper Bees, the owner of Night Nice Sky Games, Cat Slats. <laughs> Editor in chief, base Blazeball News Network or BNN, and Mer Lafferty, a sci-fi writer. Um, I am fascinated by this. It is the <laughs> you go to their website. The official description of their website is baseball at your mercy. <laughs> that it's, is incredible. So, like some of the team, like it's going on right now. Some of the teams. Are so I, if I click play ball, oh, I have to sign up. I'm not signing up right now. Let's go to the wiki. Maybe the wiki real quick will tell me. So as of February 2023, there are 24 teams in this. <laughs> so so yeah. So let's back up. Baseball centers on an absurdist simulation of baseball with fictional teams and random events such as quote the incineration of players by rogue umpires. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> On July 20th, 2021, after, as the expansion era ended, baseball became unplayable due to a black hole consuming the league. <laughs> <laughs> Starting October, 2020, uh, October 28th, 2022, a weekly event called The Fall occurred where one random returning player fell from the black hole to each team, as well as new sign-up goals and game mechanics, leading to the return of Blazeball on January 2023. It returned with a clean slate, same teams, new rosters of new and returning players, all stats randomized. Um, due to mixed feedback to the new experience, the game band opted to put the game back on a brief siesta on February 3rd to address concerns before resuming play. I don't know what I just read, but... That's I don't even know if I did here. either. That's what's going on here. So, some of the teams include the San Francisco Lovers, the um, L.A. Unlimited Tacos, the <laughs> the Mexico City Wild Wings, uh, Philly Pies. Philly does have a team. Hey, uh, Core Mechanics is the name of a team. Core Mechanics. <laughs> uh, the Atlantis Georgias, and the. Canada Moist Talkers. I don't. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> what are they trying to do with that one? So yeah, Blaze Ball. There you go. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I have sounds- no idea, I, Jason. I have no idea what just happened, but now I'm looking up Blaze Ball, and I still don't know what has happened. No idea what's going on with Blaze Ball. None. It's, it's a weird one. Uh, do you have anything else? Any other panels you want to check out before we get sucked yeah, into the black just- hole with Blaze Ball? Yeah, just last one, um, Xenoblade Chronicles. There's a panel there Thursday, 6.30. We need to talk about Xenoblade Chronicles. Uh, again, I played Xen- Xenoblade Chronicles 2, have a very much love-hate relationship with it. Uh, but Xenoblade is certainly, I-, I think, one of those RPGs that was kind of under the radar that has just become... Uh, its own thing now and and it's it's doing things that usually you wouldn't do there it's like a it's a massive like one to two hundred hour rpg game uh and it's you know crazy amount of side quests and it's just this awesome kind of jrpg and again always need to find a better term for that uh but it's just this awesome rpg uh that has kind of taken over for me like what 
a Final Fantasy was and the kind of storytelling that it does feels very Final Fantasy, but uh, in its own way. Xenoblade is just an interesting series in the way that it's gone. And uh, now the Xenoblade Chronicle series in particular uh, through three games has put together some really interesting, uh, crazy and fun stories. Cool. Um, yeah, that was one that I was looking at, too. I've never played. Why? Well, I played the first one. Um, didn't finish it, but I did play it. Um, but I, it's a series I've really wanted to play. I just cannot find the time. They are daunting tasks. Yes, uh, they're I massive, really, massive. I do really want to check them out, but I want to make sure. For I something on the them. Nintendo Switch. I mean, it yeah. is massive. That's the kind of thing where, like, if I have a, a sickness or, like, I ever go under the knife for any reason, knock on wood, and I'm just laid up for days, that's what I want to do. Oh, knock yeah. The, knock those games out. Uh, so, yeah, I have one more, too. Um, we were talking about this, uh, the fantastic WWE-affiliated YouTube channel, Up, Up, Down, Down, will be live with Austin Creed and Tyler Breeze, uh, 4.30 to 5.30 at the Condor Theater. Attention, you people, come spend an hour with your favorite best frenemies, WWE superstar Xavier Woods, a.k.a. Austin Creed, and Up, Up, Down, Down's Tyler Breeze. I'll be talking about their favorite games right now, gaming, culture, and sports entertainment, and all things Up, Up, Down, Down, plus Creed and Breeze will be taking your questions. Cool panel. If you have not watched that YouTube channel, I highly recommend recommend that you do. They do the uh, my GM back and forth, um, where it's like a big contest. They play games. All it's a lot of fun, um, and to see video game content actually affiliated with WWE still after all these years blows my mind. So that is a panel I'm going to try and get to as well. So that PAX East 2023 preview show there's a lot to take in. Um I hope you enjoyed this change to my format. I had John Jansen here the whole time. John Jansen, yeah. did you have fun? I had a ton of fun. Uh for my uh, my cheese steaks and controllers debut, I had a ton of fun. I always knew I would have fun, but yeah, I just got to talk about my favorite video games and now going to a convention where I maybe get to find more video games that I That's could right. consider one of my favorites. So and that is one thing about yeah. PAX East. If you have never been there before, if you're listening to this and you're heading up there for the first time, it is great to find that new indie darling that you had never heard of before, but then you leave and it's all you can think about. It's happened to me both times I've been there, and it's probably going to happen to me again for the third I time. I can't wait for that to happen. I, I'm, I'm seriously I'm chasing that feeling of, yeah. of get, coming away from a game like, you know, everybody knows of Final Fantasy. You know, everybody knows about Starfield. But what about the smaller game that you may not have heard about that I just will not leave my mind because of a certain concept, an aesthetic of it, uh, a certain gameplay mechanic, whatever it is, that just, man, that was... That was to me like a revolutionary or in in you know very interesting idea. So yeah. I I can't wait to chase that feeling. I can't Some, wait find either, man. Other. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna have a blast. But that is the end of episode 128 of the Chief Stakes and Controllers podcast, presented as always by Fox PHL the Gambler, 102.5 FM, 1480 AM, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you are listening to these words, as I say every single week, you have made it to the end of the episode, and I am very appreciative that you have. Um, I can't do this if you don't listen, and I appreciate you listening to me every single week this week with john jansen major thanks to him thank you sir for coming on and talking packs with me i uh, look forward to the next time that you're here so long as you do not uh sing <laughs> that clefairy song again I yes i will not it. do that i promise <laughs> <laughs> um but uh i hope you have a fantastic weekend i hope you have an even better week right behind it and we will be back next week with more of the latest and greatest gaming news here on cheesesteaks and controllers. Goodbye, everybody.